the Bodkin. Sir Richard watched with pleasure as his guest surveyed the contents of the display cabinet. It is a common enough problem for those possessed of the collecting mania to find that they very rapidly exhaust what very little attention their relatives and neighbours have in the object of their mania. All too soon there is nobody left to whom a collection can be shown, much less anyone with more than a minimally polite interest in actually seeing it. So this occasion was as much a pleasure for the owner of the archaic articles as it was for the house guest of one Reverend Dr Jasper Keane. The clergyman whose mother had been of Suffolk stock was enjoying a rare trip away from his parish duties to visit St Botolph's by way of an um, informal pilgrimage. There was nothing in the church of this special interest to anyone but for the familial collection that his recently deceased mother had been baptised there and requested that her only surviving child donate a percentage of her meagre savings to the upkeep of the building. This task was soon dispatched and indeed could have been achieved through the vagaries of the postal service but for the fact that Keane had an additional motive for visiting the quiet village of Colleton. The late matriarch had, on a number of occasions, told her children of the unsavoury history of the village and the collection maintained by the elderly squire in regards to it. I am planning, you see, the cleric told of Sir Richard, a short paper for a forthcoming colloquium on challenges facing the church. It is my intention to draw analogies between the depredations of the Witchfinder General and some of the denouncements and ideological purges one can see carried out today. At once, the rather gnome-like gentleman had whisked his visitor up to his study to view the case whose draperies had first to be whisked away. There, amidst various artefacts associated with murders and massacres from centuries past, he indicated a wooden bodkin with a four-inch iron spike. This article, he needlessly explained to his guest, was once the possession of the notorious Matthew Hopkins, who had used it to probe unfortunate suspects for the supposed devil's mark. Insensate to pain, this mark was placed upon those who had sold their souls to the beast. You are quite sure it belonged to Hopkins, the host assured his guest, that it was undoubtedly so. Cautiously removing the instrument of inquisition in order to point out the letters M.H. carved into the handle. Sir Richard went on to explain that the parish records had it that three people were arrested following interrogation by Hopkins in the village and his assistant Mary Phillips. One, the nonagenarian Mother Stride, died in the jail before coming to trial. The other two, young Marjorie Norwood and the querulous old scholar Dr. Byron, ended their lives upon their gallows, their names besmirched by accusations of cursing cattle, having shameful congress with demons, and causing the deaths of several small children. The same records refer to Hopkins' hasty departure and the discovery of a small valise in his room at the local inn. The contents of the case were nowhere listed, but it was accepted by local historians that the bodkin and the whittling knife, also ensconced in the glass case, were amongst the goods left behind. As the aged host rattled off an account of the wizened familiar spirit, supposedly in attendance on the cantankerous Byron, the reverend tilted the bodkin in the sunlight till his eye fell upon what looked like a knot in the grain. This he pushed, causing the spike to retreat into the handle. A charlatan! I knew it! At once the visitor launched into a voluble denouncement of Hopkins and his ilk that used deceptive wiles to terrorise the hapless and exploit the fears of the gullible. The exposition ended with a yelp when the spike popped back out of its chamber and pierced the hand of the cleric. 
A single droplet of blood fell upon the glass lid of the display cabinet. My dear sir, I, I had no idea it was still sharp. The ministrations of the gentry proved predictably ineffectual, but when the wound in King's palm continued to ooze blood even after their return to the drawing room, a servant appeared with a dressing. For the duration of the lunch, the puncture throbbed and distracted the Reverend from what should have been a most pleasant afternoon. That night, as Keen was readying himself for bed, the dull throb became a sharp and persistent pain. The dressing had become somewhat loosened over the course of the day, and the unfortunate man peeled it gingerly back to see the small hole still seeping blood, and the skin for an inch around it now discoloured and purplish. The bodkin had not appeared noticeably rusted, but he had heard plenty enough cases of blood poisoning suffered by careless farm labourers. He resolved to contact a, a general practitioner on his return to home, to London, the following afternoon. Normally, Reverend Keane did not dream, or at least he never remembered them. When he awoke screaming at 3 a.m., the image refused to leave him of the bearded man in a black capitaine hat, glaring at him as he thrust the bodkin repeatedly into his flesh. For an hour he sat in the armchair, shaking and sweating, starting at every sound and wincing each time for his tender parts were covered in bruises where the iron spike had pierced him. Even as the dawn penetrated the heavy curtains, the mental spectre had not fully dissolved, nor the echoes of the softly insinuating voice demanding that he confess to some unstated crime faded. Shuffling down to the inn's dining room like a man twice his age, Keane reached for the tepid teapot and dropped it to the flagstones where it shattered. His right hand had no grip and a queasy glance showed that not only had the dressing come away entirely, but the dark purple stain had spread across the whole palm. Not only did it look repulsive, but even the slightest flexing of tendons caused him to almost weep with pain. Giving up on the hope of tea, he sat as still as could be, hoping to calm mind and body alike. An unfortunate infection, that was all it could be, coupled with nightmares brought on because of what he knew of the history of the bodkin. He murmured apologies to the maid, as he, she picked up the shattered crockery, her obvious annoyance replaced by a look of concern as she saw the state of the man giving her such unnecessary work. The only other guest in the dining room looked as one might at a potentially infectious leper. Dreams of being accused raised the possibility of some deep-rooted guilt. Always a forward-thinker, the Reverend had read Freud and grasped the concept of repressed fears and memories. His faith was conventional to the point of being rather bland, as his sister was wont to tease him, so he could be scarce accused of heresy nor of any belief in things occult. Keaton limped slowly to the bathroom and tipped the remaining bath salts from the jar into the tub before running the water as hot as the inn's antiquated system could make it. Removing his dressing gown, he surveyed the bruises in the long mirror that dotted his thighs, stomach, back and arms. Each was starting to turn a horrible shade of purple. As the steam began to fill the room, the mirror misted over till he could only see a blurred outline. For an instant it seemed as if the indistinct figure were wearing a wide-brimmed hat. Lack of sleep, it was nothing. Some painkillers and a good night's rest would not dispel. It was with considerable effort that he perched on the edge of the bath and gradually swung his legs into the almost uncomfortably hot water. Whimpering, he sank fully into the bath and sighed as the heat penetrated his aching limbs and torso. 
He thought of the benighted Dr. Byron, hauled before the court after being subjected to all manner of torments and indignities. The poor man had finally admitted all charges after swimming the witch hissed a soft voice moments before a bony hand shoved Keane's head under the heated waters. Struggle as he might, arms and legs flailing, he sunk and sunk into the murky depths, where the weeds wrapped themselves around his face, clogging his mouth. Sir, sir, are you all right? Plump arms pulled the head out of the bathwater, slapping his back as he coughed and sputtered, gasping for air. The sensation of a mouthful of river weeds faded as he regurgitated soapy water onto the bathroom floor, eyes streaming and stinging. He must have fallen asleep and stepped under. The publican's man wrapped him in towels and guided him to the safety of the chair beside the tub. The platitudes flowed around him as Keane sat trying to recover his wits. The punctured hand was still hideous to behold, and made the process of getting dressed almost impossible, without the frankly embarrassing assistance of the over-solicitous lad. The conviction came over Keane that the further away he went from this Suffolk village, the better his injury would become. With this in mind, he took an earlier train than he originally intended, vowing never to return to his mother's birthplace.